housewives primary reach sir for our economy all over the country actually you can get a keep a statue from kotayam to kohima every district one lady statue you can keep below that you can write reason for our economic growth so this is something very very important many and our, our housewives are not given adequate amount of price for this in the midst of you know ability to manage in inflation and other things actually very interesting goldman sachs wrote a report in 2010 infrastructure investment needs are 1.4 trillion today it is of the order of something like uh, 7 8 trillion actually but they say that domestic saving generated will suffice india would need minimal fdi this is uh, not uh, told by if i tell this people will say oh the iim processor is just pulling the fast one but if goldman sachs is supported uh, then it will be more sort of a uh, authentic type of a thing domestic saving and domestic demand driven economy we are not telling fin fdi are not required or anything we are not telling that they can be excluded no something very important i want to mention here if something is done by indian woman it is the most reasonable and rational thing do not criticize it they know instinctively what is good for the family and they are much more planning the people worried about the people men are not so much worried about the people man think that um, today i will learn and then tell me the women are much more concerned about what will happen after 5 years what will happen after 10 years so that is the reason namaste to all the viewers i welcome you to this talk organized by center for indic studies which shall challenge traditional views on the indian economy highlighting the vital role of small businesses and household enterprises through the book india unincorporated the book offers valuable insights making it essential for aspiring entrepreneurs and readers curious about india's economic realities We have with us the author of India Unincorporated Dr R Vedyanathan who is a retired professor of finance at IIM Bangalore a graduate of the Loyola College Madras and a masters from the Indian Statistical Institute Calcutta he obtained his doctorate from IIM Calcutta where he also taught for 4 years he is a two time fulbright scholar and a fellow ICSSR visiting faculty at various universities in USA and UK He has been selected by Business Today as one of the best ten professors at all of IIMs. Uh, he has the rare privilege of being in various committees of regulators like SEBI, RBI, IRDA, PFRDA. He is a consultant to many organizations and is on the board of many corporates. He is a fellow of the Salzburg Seminar as well. He has been conferred with Life Contribution Award by Asia Pacific Risk and Insurance Association. and kaibo life in 2019 his book india on ink role of non corporate sectors in india which shall focus on india and uh, at large asian value systems has been well received by planners and policy makers his other book on black money and tax havens has been acclaimed by experts his recent book cast as social capital has been well received by the market as well he is on the advisory council of vivekanand international foundation He was a member of National Security Advisory Board under National Security Council 2019 to 2020. He is Ko Ramaswamy Chair Professor in uh, Public Policy at Shastri University Tanjavur, Tamil Nadu, and Emeritus Adjunct Professor of Rashtriya Raksha University, an institution of national importance at Ahmedabad. I welcome you warmly, sir. Thank you for gracing us with your presence and request you to take over from here. Thank you, Pooja, for the kind introduction. It's always a pleasure to talk to students of Indus University, particularly our center. Much earlier, I recall quite a number of years before, I have given a talk on this uh, cost as social capital, and uh, I have also visited, if I recall, uh, 
I think uh, once the university itself uh, campus and uh, I'm really happy that Voges gave such a nice introduction. Thank her for her uh, kindness, cooperation and courtesy. Now today we will uh, you know, talk about the non-corporate India. This uh, non-corporate is uh, given by several names and uh, some of them are uh, popular, namely unorganized sector and uh, Sometimes it is called informal sector. Sometimes it is called, uh, you know, what one can call uh, unorganized, as I mentioned. And, uh, you know, different terminology is uh, used in different contexts by different people. And uh, basically, the word unorganized is uh, something which is very disturbing because it uh, indicates that it is a disorganized, that there is a need for organizing it. Actually, the motivation for this uh, came to me quite a number of years before. I was, uh, you know, there is a flower, vegetable vendor near to my home. She comes in the early morning around uh, 6 30, 7 o'clock in her uh, moped. You know, what is popular in our part of the country, TVS 50. And uh, she loads nearly, you know, one uh, lorry load of material in that. I do not know how she manages. She brings it and then she sits in the road uh, with her uh, baskets of vegetables throughout the day. And uh, around uh, 6 ish, uh, when the lights are on, she doesn't have any electric electricity connection or anything. She leaves. Day after day, seven times a week, 24 hours, uh, sorry, uh, 12 months a year, she comes and does it, except some. Uh, puja time or something, she goes to her hometown. Otherwise, she is there throughout. Now, I used to wonder, she is uh, something like, uh, you know, 12 hours in between, she goes for restroom and somebody will uh, stand there. And she knows her customers. She knows the raw material. She knows who likes what. Like she knows that, you know, I take bindi, I, you know, somebody else take uh, you know, uh, brinjal and all these things. She is very good in, uh, in this. Nowadays, of course, we will come to that a bit later. She is also having this uh, GPA facility in her shop. In her, you know, what one can call this uh, mobile facility in her shop. Now, I was uh, looking at where does she come into our economy? She is doing a you know, productive work. She is having uh, sales. Uh, she is having cash realization, all those things. And uh, when I was uh, going through the Central Statistical Organization, I am a statistics student basically from Indian Statistical Institute. I found to my surprise that she is categorized as unorganized sector. I was uh, puzzled because she is much better organized than many multinational companies in this country. You know, she is very well organized and why is she called unorganized? And more than that, in the same book, after a couple of pages, I found a government uh, classified as organized. Can you beat this? Government is organized, which is a contradiction in term. Government is the most disorganized uh, form of uh, organization in our country. Anyhow, so this... Uh, made me intrigued and this made me to look at what exactly constitute this unorganized sector and other. Basically, it's a very interesting terminology. Sometimes the terminology used is informal sector, but these two are not same. Informal is used more by uh, the, for the workers and other thing, by the uh, world organization, wherein it means the workers are hired on an informal basis, there is no proper contract or anything given to them and there is no insurance or anything given to them. All these things are there. That's the definition of informal comes more in the context of employment, more in the context of uh, laborers and other. And uh, organized in India by and large mean you are covered by any one of the act in this country means uh, you are covered by uh, Shops and Establishment Act or you are covered by Income Tax Act 
or you are covered by Factories Act, various uh, types of regulation. Whenever you come under the government uh, clutches, government thing, you are considered as organized. If not, you are considered as not organized. But uh, even under the government, sometimes, and uh, you know, most of these uh, proprietorship partnership forms of organization, they are all not under the category of organized. And in the manufacturing area, primarily factory group is considered as organized. And with its factory, there is a uh, distinction between, uh, there is an unorganized group within the manufacturing also in India. And almost all the service sector, service sector we will come to, is not just IT alone. Service sector consists of transport, wholesale trade, retail trade, and uh, various other type of uh, uh, hotels and restaurants various other type of activities like plumber, fitter, carpenter, hundreds of these uh, trades and all these constitute service sector. And in service sector, by and large, the company form of organization is considered as organized. And uh, others are all considered as uh, unorganized or non-organized uh, groups. So in manufacturing, if you are covered by the Factories Act, Factories Act consisting of 20 people without power and the 10 plus people with power and all those definitions are applicable. Anyhow, that is a, so different context, different terminology is used, most important. In US actually, this uh, group, what we call as unorganized or whatever it is, it is basically around 5 to 6%. All others are corporate group. Most of them are corporate group. For instance, uh, uh, when I was in school, every road I used to find one or two mochis uh, stitching uh, shoes and chapels and other things. Or tailors available in every one of the road. And today you will find it very difficult to locate a mochi actually <laughs> or locate a uh, tailor. Because uh, they are all gone into organized activities in the sense of you know, in US, uh, all these uh, small retail fellows, uh, what are called mom and pop stores, have been absorbed by Walmart. They have all put into blue uniform and everybody is standing in the store. Uh, welcome, sir. You come, sir. Uh, yes, sir. It is come, sir. Like that, they talk. All these uh, uh, retail fellows. So, in our context, very important, this is the point to be remembered that uh, in US it is called residual because it's a small percentage. In India, roughly 50% of the national income comes out of these uh, active, unorganized or non-corporate sector, 50%. Still, we call them as residual. This is very peculiar actually. Because in US they are called residual, something 50% can never be called residual. But we just... Uh, imitate or we just uh, you know copy whatever us is uh, terminologically telling we will use that because we are genetically tied to the us and europe and everything we will come to that okay now what is the agriculture roughly in india constitute uh, 15 percent manufacturing mining around uh, 20 25 percent the remaining is services. Services will be around 60%, 60 plus. Service sector is the largest component of Indian economy. Of course, a lot of discussion take place about, uh, you know, whenever people leave agriculture, how to get them into manufacturing and other. Let's not get into those things. We are primarily a service-dominated uh, economy. And within that, we will uh, just uh, show that slide, share of different sector in NDP, the third slide, third number or second number after my name and other, no, third, third. Ah. NDP, many of you would have, uh, no, before this, before this, yeah, NDP, many of you may be familiar with the net domestic product one of the terminology used in the national income computation. GDP is gross domestic product. 
the difference comes in the form of depreciation. Anyhow, share in national net domestic product is roughly, these are approximate because plus minus every year they change. It's not identical. That's why we have put that uh, approximate. 17% is agriculture. All of the agriculture is private in India. Let's be clear about this. Except this uh, forest and uh, certain activities which are under government. Government, government means all governments, central government, state government, municipalities, public sector undertaking, then public sector banks, all of them are under government. They all have a share of 18%. Private corporate, which consists of all our bigger companies which are listed in the stock exchange are not listed. Ambani, Sadani, uh, TVS, and uh, Birlas, and all of them come under the private corporate. They are all company form of organization. Some of them are listed. Not all of them are listed. There is something like uh, roughly 15 lakh companies or something, if I recall correctly. Out of that, uh, we have hardly, you know, uh, some uh, 1,500 or so companies only listed. Not all of them are listed in the stock exchange. But uh, they are private corporate. Then partnership proprietorship forms of organization. That is 50% of our economy. Let's be very clear about it. And uh, that is the unincorporated or non-corporate sector. And in US, it is around, uh, you know, 5 to 6%. Here also, we call them as residual. There also, they call them as residual. Not only this, in employment, if you look at it, next one, next slide, you can see. No, 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 employment, yeah. The self-employed and contract labor constitute 85% of Indian economy. Those who are working in companies or in government are only 12 to 15%. Nowadays, there is a lot of talk about gig, gig, gig employment. <laughs> all, all India is gig, actually. There is no need for any separate study for it. Self-employed constitute your retail trade, you look at it. All of them are self-employed. You look at the small uh, transport, both the goods, services, as well as the, uh, what one can call this uh, human transport. All of them are self-employed. One track or two track owners, one bus owners, two bus owners, and other thing. We don't have a greyhound or a huge type of a facility like US. And all your fitter, plumber, all these people are all contract laborers. You go to any town, including Ahmedabad, you will find in the early morning time, in the corner of some roads, large number of people will be crowding and standing. They are all waiting to be picked up by the, uh, what one can call, construction or various other type of industry people, their requirement. And then they will be taken in lorries or they will be taken. Whoever is not taken is not employed for that particular day. Whoever is taken is employed for that day. You can see them standing actually. And mostly very interesting. In Ahmedabad, you will see more Rajasthani standing in the uh, corner of the road. In Bangalore, you will see more uh, Odi Odisha people and uh, other uh, state people. By and large, they are migrant laborers who are preferred. And some of them are very skilled actually. Even in places like the Madras or uh, Bangalore, there are large number of uh, employees from Rajasthan, Orissa, UP, Bihar and other things. A, because uh, they are all available in uh, large uh, numbers. B, the rates are also lower for these uh, migrant laborers. B, they are obviously not uh, covered by any return contract or anything. And uh, last but not the least is they are highly skilled people. Some of you may or may not know, large number of plumbers in India are from Orissa. A single uh, location called Kendarpara provides uh, 60 to 70 percent of the national plumbers. Somewhere in the 90s, we suggested to the Orissa government, why don't you start a university for plumbing? Plumbing is not just a laying pipe pipeline anymore. It's a very cumbersome, very major activity. So, 
and most of them are self uh, you know learning in the sense uh, they either get trained by their seniors or they get trained uh, in the job okay so employment wise largest portion of employment is by the non corporate it's not uh, next slide you see saving saving is another interesting the government and corporate uh, saving is not very large government hardly 1 to 2% of our saving private corporate households are the largest saving in india compared to other countries where corporate is much larger saving household saving is very small in other countries it will be something like uh, 5 to 6% or something india household saving is very very large there are several reasons for it in other countries there is a social security uh, net to provided by the government in the western country when you retire you get uh, some minimum amount of funds from social security india everybody doesn't get any so households have to save for themselves housewives and uh, so i would say and this household saving goes to the commercial bank and through the banking system it becomes investment for the corporates and others so from a uh, you know saving point of view one can definitely say housewives are the single largest contributor for our economic growth if somebody asks me who is actually the largest saving group and uh, who are the i told that uh, housewives are primary further more you can go in the same slide i think it's something is there no ah housewives primary reason for our economic growth all over the country actually you can kept a keep a statue from kotayam to kohima every district one lady statue you can keep below that you can write reason for our economic growth so this is something very very important many and our housewives are not given adequate amount of price for this in the midst of you know ability to manage in inflation and other things okay so saving largest portion comes from household not fia and fdi the foreign investment in india is never exceed at 10 to 12 percent the remaining portion comes from from domestic saving so we are a domestic saving economy and a domestic demand driven economy also we are not export uh, uh, driven like uh, taiwan or thailand or something ours is large portion of our because our size of population is also very large and uh, even our middle class even if you take it to be some 30 40% it would come to 40 to 50 crores it's a very large uh, number actually so domestic uh, demand driven and domestic saving driven this is something which we should keep in the back of the mind and for that uh, housewives are primarily responsible for largest portion of our saving we will see also next in the service sector fastest growing activity everybody service sector mean everybody remember narayan murthy software they think that's also that's important of course that uh, earns a lot of foreign exchange 120 billion foreign exchange but the share in the gdp is around 5 to 6 percent only ites what are the major activity of service construction all over the country today you will find a huge amount of construction going on in terms of apartments in terms of roads in terms of bridges in terms of uh, railway need metros so many type of every city you go today you will find some construction activity is going on trade wholesale trade as well as retail trade they come under the service sector retail trade is uh, done by millions of uh, small fellows including all those petty shop people who sit on the roadside and sell you the vegetables flowers and various other things transport other railways of course everybody knows is government owned transport other transport we mean in terms of buses in terms of uh, uh, lorries which carry goods uh, cement uh, sand so many things and incidentally 
eighty percent of uh, private transport in India is one or two truck owners only. We don't have a very large scale uh, thousands of truck owners still in our country. There are some Agrawals and other thing which is a large fleet, but that's a relatively a smaller one. Most of the private tracks are all one track or two track within city only. They won't even be doing intra city, intercity only. Then you have hotels and restaurant, all type of restaurant, you know, street corner and the street, sometime on the platform, sometime on the uh, street in terms of push cart. You know, in South, you will see lots of them selling dosas and other things, all on the side of the road. Everywhere you will see, you know, uh, this uh, Pani Puri or various other type of things are all included in the restaurant. There are sit and eat places and there are very large hotels also. Some of them like your Taj group or Oberoi group and other. But here, largest portion is small restaurant. And uh, for information, the restaurant is the fastest growing industry in India. This is something very interesting. I think uh, Generation Z or whatever you call it, millennials or whatever, youngsters, they are not uh, much uh, into cooking. I think they all want to eat out. So you go on a, particularly on a Friday evening, in some of the restaurant, you won't get a seat even to sit. You have to wait outside. Some places in uh, cities like Bangalore, Chennai, they give token. You have to wait outside till the fellows inside clear away. So it's the fastest growing in terms of uh, activities, actually. The way in which uh, outside food is being consumed nowadays and the cooking is uh, slowly becoming endangered, what you may loosely call. And I am sure in another couple of years, advertisement will come for one BH only. Bedroom and hall. No cake, kitchen. There is not required actually. I used to uh, tell lightheartedly when I started teaching in the 80s, almost all the girl students used to come in either off sari or kurta, you know, what do you call this? Uh, uh, sari or uh, this uh, Punjabi uh, type of uh, kurta. And, uh, but today, hardly I find anybody coming in saris. All of them come only in jeans. And uh, sometimes torn jeans, it's called. It's I don't know, it's the torn in the knee. It's a very important thing, I'm told. And uh, I thought they buy the jeans and tear it. No, sir, torn jean is sold actually. And it is more expensive than a regular jean. So I call it a six rat jeans. That is, you buy the jean, take a bamboo basket, put it inside, close it, put uh, some uh, seven or eight rats inside the bamboo basket. After a couple of days, you open it, you will find it in a very nice uh, situation. All the rats will run away, of course. You will have only the jeans. And there will be more non-jeans portion than jeans portion. That is what today is uh, most popular. And uh, suddenly one day, they all came in saris. I was surprised. What is this, sir? They said, no, sir, today we are ind you know, uh, indigenous. So we want to celebrate what is called our local one day. Same way, I think uh, the cooking also will take place. One day in the year, people will, or uh, one day in the year, they will cook at home. There is, you know, that's, uh, they would like to celebrate uh, what is called the kitchen day. So, hotel and restaurant, fastest growing industry in the country today. By restaurant, I, I told you, you know, it imply, includes all the street corner, small and other things. Then real estate ownership of dwelling, then other services, including the service of priest, pandits, and uh, you know, plumber, pitter, carpenter, you know, there are something like 66 or 65 type of uh, trades and they are all coming under the other services. So, these are the fastest growing activities. Very important to note, not agriculture, not manufacturing. 
So if you see the next slide, you will find that we have given the rate of growth of some of these activities. Most of them are around 7% to 8%. The major growth rate of the economy comes from the service sector. Agriculture is around 3.6, 3.1. We have given the growth rate from 0, 4, 5 to 11, 12, as well as 11, 12 to 17, 18. And both are at a constant, right? So what you call the CAGR, we call it in jargon, compounded annual growth rate. Both of them, you can see there, non-railway transport and uh, trade is growing at 10%. Banking and insurance, financial services at 7% and uh, other services around 9% like that. And uh, while well, this other area, agriculture and uh, manufacturing also growing, but uh, these are the dominant areas. Service sector is the most dominant in terms of, and in service sector, we mentioned that more than two third is by partnership and proprietorship firms. They constitute the bulk of the service sector or non-corporate India. We don't have still like in US uh, any global or rather national level chains for many of these activities still. And uh, if you go to the next slide, we will see the role of FIA and FDA. Every day morning, you know, like uh, we call it in our place, uh, Venkatesha Suprabhada, you know, that's the, the music in which we wake up. You know, Hema Subalakshmi is the most popular singer. Every day we invoke Lord Venkateshwara. You get up, get up like that. Same way, every day we want to, what is the FIA and FDA? And economic times, so many, you know, FIA is increasing, FDA is increasing, FDA is decreasing, some are pulling out. It's a major threat type of thing, the screaming at lunch. And uh, we are, and their share never is more than 10%. FIA and FDA. FDA is the physical direct investment. FIA is the financial in terms of shares and uh, bonds and our domestic saving is 90 to 92 percent. Actually, very interesting. Goldman Sachs wrote a report in 2010. Infrastructure investment needs are 1.4 trillion. Today, it is of the order of something like uh, 7, 8 trillion actually. But they say that domestic saving generated will suffice. India would need minimal FDI. This is uh, not uh, told by, if I tell this, people will say, oh, the IAM processor is just pulling a fast one. But if Goldman Sachs is uh, quoted, then it will be more you know, sort of a uh, authentic type of a thing. Domestic saving and domestic demand driven economy. We are not telling FA and FDA are not required or anything. We are not telling that they can be excluded. No, they are something like pickled to curd rice. Since I come from South, I use this uh, uh, analogy. Other people can use something like it is like gur, you know, gur, you know, this uh, jaggery to your paratha or your roti or something in winter time, right? That is the one which side dish which goes, right? So they are required, but they shouldn't be treated as a main item. This is very, very important. We should know the limit to which FI and FDA are able to help us. That's a good thing. Nothing wrong about it. But uh, they shouldn't be mistaken to be the main course or main item. So domestic saving and uh, in that we already told in domestic saving, what is the role of the household saving? That is most important. That is the one which is actually facilitating our economic growth. We will see also so much is uh, talked about about share market. Everybody says uh, share markets are extremely critical. Every day, you know, people ask where is Sensex going? Where is uh, Nifty? Every day morning, if Sensex moves by some percent, immediately people are happy that our economy is. Uh, and uh, which is, uh, you know, actually 
not a very uh, correct thing actually then sex can move up and down i am not telling anything wrong about it whoever is invested can make money out of it but uh, the entire uh, gdp share of gdp of this nifty uh, or sensex companies would not be more than 78% so they are they are not really movers and shakers of our economy itself they are movers and shakers of those who have invested funds in them and they can make some gain out of them if it is possible we will go to the next one we all think that uh, we are involved in the middle class is involved in the share market which is not true largest portion of our financial saving goes to the banks we are a bank oriented country banks insurance provident fund then uh, non bank finance companies you know chits various type of uh, thing trust and other thing where we keep our money only 1 to 2% goes in the shares and bonds recently it has increased to 3% because of the mutual fund some of the money is routed through the mutual fund into the share market but still the percentage is very very small the reasons are Uh, very important one is china japan europe is very much similar to india all of them are bank oriented economy actually in japan uh, three four years before the bank told the investors if you keep money in in our bank we will charge you because they were having surplus funds they don't know what to do with them but still people went and deposited in the banks only japan is one of the most advanced technologically in terms of the share market and people are not very enthusiastic about share market us is the only country where people are very much uh, involved with the share market so we should think that us is the world and you know everybody is doing that no and another thing is indians have uh, you know reluctance in share market because abhiman news are plenty some of you would have heard about uh, i'm sure the name of abhiman news this uh, if not uh, kindly read read it up he comes in a story called mahabharat he doesn't come in ramayan that's most important so this man he knew how to get into a chakravyuha get into a formation in the background but unfortunately he doesn't know how to come out of it this is the story of abhimanyu actually it is uh, you know the story goes that uh, when he was in the womb of his mother he was uh, taught how to get into chakravyuha but by the time she delivered they didn't finish how to get out of the chakravyuha how to so this is what uh, uh, say so similarly large number of our investors also know how to buy go and buy shares but unfortunately they do not know how to get out of the share market at the appropriate time they are all i call the million abhimanyus in the indian share bazaar they all weep in the share market oh we have invested so much and we have not gained anything so many of them go into banks 60% are uh, financial saving goes to banking then some portion goes to employee provident fund many of you would have heard about it then national pension scheme insurance that is also another area where money is invested so this is the so we are not a share market economy or anything but the image is created that uh, all of the thing is only share market particularly in a state like gujarat if you are in ahmedabad after you know few minutes of conversation the first question people ask me is where to invest sir so that is the most uh, you know which share is good which is you know they are extremely uh, good in that unlike <laughs> i uh, jokingly say in punjab when i have conversation after uh, one hour 50 or half an hour the discussion will be where the daru is best where one can go and have so different uh, uh, groups have different orientation in terms of and of course bengal the discussion will be about uh, government and marxist marxism and uh, 
how to bring it down and uh, all this uh, uh, what one can call. So, shares are not uh, the decisive factor in our economy. It is factor for those who put their money there. That's all. Not for the total economy. Not only that, our people invest a substantial amount of funds in what can be called the gold also. And uh, real estate, gold and flats, gold and house. These two are called physical saving. And house is also one of the most important thing. One of the achievement of a, a person in India is considered as, does he have a house? Did he build a house of his own? It can be a small thatched house or it can be a... But did he build it? Otherwise, he is not considered as man enough or something who has not done enough for his family. Okay. And another myth is this Reserve Bank of India rates. <coughs> we'll see that. Next one. RBI rates are considered as very critical. Every time you know, people discuss is RBI. Why RBI, RBI rates are affecting the commercial banks? They decide at what percentage they would take uh, surplus funds from the commercial bank or at what percentage they will lend it to the commercial bank. This is uh, in terms of uh, repo rate and reverse repo rate. And The basic idea is RBI will be able to influence the commercial bank, who in turn will be able to influence the market. This is what is the idea. But uh, what is called in economic, the transmission is very poor in India. First of all, RBI may increase the rate or decrease the rate that may not be passed on by the commercial bank to the public at large. This is very, very important. Commercial bank may keep the profit to themselves. That is one area. Second is, Aggregate amount of uh, trade and uh, commerce, you know, if you look at the whole economy, what is the proportion of money lent by banks in spite of all this uh, development and other things will be something like uh, uh, 30 to 40 percent. The remaining is coming from money lenders, chits, then uh, non-bank, uh, small uh, companies and various other things. And they constitute the bulk of the uh, working capital requirement for all these uh, service sector people. I am talking about hotels and restaurants, your uh, retail shop people, all these people. And uh, trade credit rates are very high. The bank rates we talk about 8%, 10%, that is not applicable actually. For instance, very small retail, uh, like my flower vendor, she gives flower to me on a daily basis. She borrows at uh, up to 1% per day. That is 100 rupee. Evening, she is expected to return 101 rupee per day. Don't even try to make it annualized. Right? So that is the, and most of the time, she doesn't return the principal. What happened is the 100 is carried forward to the next day. So that one rupee only she has to pay on a regular basis. This is what is the uh, going rate. And it can be half a percent sometimes. And uh, for that, uh, the security is asked by the money lenders. Most of the time, the security is the gold. Or bangles or our necklace or chain or something. Gold is a major collateral item in India. We will come to that immediately. So it is not something people say, you know, the ladies buy gold, it is unproductive and other things. They do not know anything about our economy, how our economy is functioning. Our economy is functioning based on the mortgage of gold. By this, I have what is known as a simple index of our performance of the economy. What is the index? I look at the, my flower vendor. She gives flowers, measuring it with the heart. One up, one 
and uh, if both are bangles are seen by me gold bangles and uh, it means the economy is doing well if one bangle is not there the economy is showing some problem if both the bangles are gone when she measures that means economy is in deep trouble because she would have mortgaged both the bangles in order to get some uh, credit for the requirements so that is the type of a uh, uh, lending system in india and uh, most of them are by what one can call organized money lenders and uh, their rates are high but their npa in other words the non performing asset as the jargon goes in the bank those which are not paid back is relatively very low something very surprising not even quarter percent or one so i asked one money lender i know how do you manage it he says sir we have collection agent who goes around collecting every month i told who is the collection agent he says collection agents are about 6 feet tall and more than 70 kg weight very simple i told i satisfy one the condition <laughs> 70 kg but not the height in the sense they use the and they are very knowledgeable locally about these uh, people to whom they have lent in the sense uh, there uh, if some marriage is taking place in the borrower's house they immediately know the funds are not going to come immediately or if a construct if a house is constructed by the borrower then they know their money has gone into the house like that you know they keep and the if a uh, you know cow or a buffalo dies in the borrower's house then they know that there is a loss of income from uh, selling milk like that they have very good idea about the local uh, condition local uh, customer and that's how the you know, and a huge portion and there are surveys uh, conducted by the central statistical organization nowadays national statistical survey is part of the cso central statistical organization they have done a socio economic survey very interesting most of these uh, non corporate or unorganized sector 90% of them uh, do not rely on institutional finance institutional finance mean finance from banks uh, other big non banking institution etc they rely on money lenders local caste groups and extended family relatives and caste uh, influencers these are the people from whom they are borrowing and uh, this is the actual type of a situation so rbi may announce some rates and other thing but they are not uh, significantly impact but slowly their role is becoming more the bank role and as well as organize because of the digital economy which is increasing in india now you find that uh, most of the small shops and uh, establishment also you can use actually the paytm i am that has become very popular paytm as well as uh, you know gpay and several other type of methods are there even the smallest retail uh, shop has that uh, picture you just pay through your and uh, <laughs> actually there is one type of uh, they bring the bull uh, dressed up decked up another thing with all the colorful uh, shawl and other thing on top and then the fellow comes with the music instrument yeah. basically in the early morning he is some sort of a uh, begging but in a very uh, sophisticated you know better way the bull based you know he comes on the road and that fellow has uh, hung one petam thing on the bull's uh, neck he said you can use this too so even the beggars are now using this uh, opportunity so this has increased leaps and bounds actually billions of uh, uh, transactions are being conducted the last 5 to 6 years and that mean two things substantial portion of our economy is getting organized is getting into the banking system and to that extent 
the role of black money is coming down. This is something very, very interesting and important to note. The second is, because of this uh, digitization, quite a number of these uh, you know, banks are able to reach out to these uh, people, uh, you know, these uh, small retailers and other things who are significantly dependent on uh, money lenders and other uh, groups. We have to wait and see what will happen in the next uh, maybe four, four or five years. How much of this uh, digitization is going to alter the way in which our credit market are function or uh, our credit markets are being used? This is something very, very interesting to observe. And uh, technology is something which is uh, changing the way in which we are uh, operating. For instance, if you had traveled in railways in the 1990s, you would know what I am talking about. You have to meet that uh, TT, the man with a black coat, in order to get a seat arranged by you. And then you have to pay him some money, obviously. And uh, I was told by a general manager of original uh, this uh, uh, railway, GM, he told me, in those days, the cabinet minister, railway minister, he used to ring up and say, who should become a ticket checker in which station? Sialda, you put him, you put him in Madras Central, you put him in Hora, like that, you know. They used to, because these were all considered as ATM posting, that is some amount of uh, money can be collected. And that's a big uh, thing. Today, after the introduction of the software-based reservation and other things, there is no need for you to go and meet any TTE or anything. Actually, they say that uh, you know, if you have your mobile phone, that's enough. You can show it, actually, your uh, ticket. And uh, there's no need to have even a printed one. And if you are in a waitlisted, it is automatically upgraded. So this whole area of uh, railway travel has been significantly, the corruption level has come down for passengers. Something, technology reduces corruption. This is something which we should uh, keep in the back of the mind. Same thing has happened about passport. You know, after the introduction of this uh, TCS and others into the passport uh, thing, you can get you know online registration and uh, reasonable. Earlier, you require to have one agent to collect the passport. You have to go to the for verification by the police as well as and some amount of money you have to pay to the agent who will arrange for the passport to be got. So technology is significantly altering the way in which we are uh, functioning in our economy, and it reduces corruption. It facilitates uh, integration of these uh, type of uh, unorganized into organized. And uh, that is what today is happening. And we have to wait and see in the next uh, five years what would happen. How much of these uh, uh, will be integrated into the organized system, the informal or formal sector. Next. We will see the role of, uh, this is uh, gold. Gold, everybody is, uh, you know, in India at least, everybody is fond of gold. Nobody is, whether it is, uh, and uh, and all government, uh, you know, agents always uh, argue that uh, it is unproductive. Why should women buy this and all these things? And uh, our purchase is increasing only. It's not uh, coming down or anything. India, you can see there, uh, between 95 and uh, 22, we have given the data. And for selected years, we have not given for every year. Or, but roughly one-third or 30% of the global uh, gold is purchased by India every year. Some of you may remember, around the early 60s, Maraji Desai was in uh, there, the gold control order came. The gold was literally... Uh, banned in India. And we don't produce much gold. We produce hardly, you know, 5% or something. Significant portion of the gold is only imported. And the gold control order uh, was uh, clamped on the import of gold. And uh, But we were buying gold in spite of the ban. The 
gold used to come from dubai in uh, these uh, illegal boats and uh, well, people were buying you know there was no uh, people who got married between 65 and uh, 90 when the rules got amended all got the gold uh, and uh, allotted and uh, you know the purchased and everything gold was never in uh, literally even though it is banned it was never that's a very interesting thing about india we may ban something but still it will be on it will be working and actually one of my american colleague told your gold control order is uh, a very important reason for the global terrorism <laughs> he told because all these uh, you know illegal dows and these boats which were bringing gold from dubai dubai didn't have any other activity dubai actually was completely for this type of activity so he was mentioning all these people collected huge amount of gold uh, and then sold it in the black market in india and that surplus funds were used for for terror activity and if you see most of these gold smugglers were also involved with the terrorists anyway that's a separate topic now everybody says uh, buying gold is not a desirable thing and uh, gold you know i remember once from finance secretary so because obviously the purchase of gold involves huge amount of forex forex outflow for india in terms of you know like that uh, because he was uh, you know i was uh, teaching at iam that time he came and have a big talk about uh, gold being unproductive not required and last time i asked what about your wife who has come with you he says you know she has gone to see some gold jewelry another thing in bangalore so this is that it's all you know very good to say but in practice it is not that the reasons are very simple the large portion of the gold as, as i told you is used as a collateral or a mortgage for the purposes of uh, doing business that's the first item which can be uh, kept as a mortgage. This is the one which is uh, understood by the women of this country. Second is, it's easy to understand. You see, most of the women, poorer segment, they may not know about shares, bonds, derivative product or banks even, but they know gold because it has been with them for a long period of time. And uh, incidentally, very important, it's considered as the asset of the woman. It's not considered as the, it's the only asset which is exclusively that of women. That's why it's called a three run. You know, it's not, uh, and uh, by and large, it is never sold without uh, the consent of the woman of the house. Only when there is a major emergency, it is sold. It's not uh, bought and sold, bought and sold and other. It is bought and kept, actually. In some of you who might have seen very early movies will know when the business is down, the woman will remove her bangles and necklace and give it to her husband in order to take care of the business which is collapsed. And one soap sagid will come behind in this uh, thing. And, uh, that's the way in which. Uh, so it's easy to understand, particularly if the Children are rapacious after the death of the husband. What is very easy is the gold which will sustain her throughout her life. So it's a most important to remember. It's a pension product. It's a pension product or it's a insurance product for the woman. Second is it is divisible. You can buy 10 gram of gold. You can buy 5 gram of gold and anything. But in the case of say real estate, you can't buy, go and buy, tell him I will buy 100 feet today and uh, tomorrow I will buy 200 square feet. No, it's not possible. Either you have to buy the flat or you don't have to. It's divisible. My servant might, whenever I give her some 1000 or 2000 you know, Diwali bonus, she will go and buy gold. Small quantity, earring or... I asked her, she says, then what they will do, accumulate it over a period, convert earring into bangle, bangle into necklace and all these things. So this is something very, very interesting. Third is, it's very easy to 
bequeathed to the next generation. So if you have shares, you have to prove, you have to have nominee, you have to have the will, you have to go for the lawyer and all. But if you have got a house, you have to establish who is the legal heir and death. But in the case of gold, it's a question of death. What is called <coughs> possession is ownership. If the Bahu comes to the house, there is a mother-in-law out of affection, gives her a chain, and he puts her, she puts it on her neck, it is her, her fault. There is no documentation. There is no uh, registration of assets or anything. In a house where there are four or five women, each one will have one box. That will be her goal. Everybody knows. Others may be using it for function or occasion, but uh, not ownership. When my grandfather, I remember, passed away, called all the ladies and then gave them this bangle is yours, this necklace is yours. From it. But uh, not all were happy, that separate issue. But uh, very easy to distribute in terms of the assets. So this is the uh, very easy to be quick. So it's an asset which is understood by easily by women, divisible, portable. You know, if she can carry it from one location to another location very easily. A house cannot be carried like that. It can be disposed of only to those who are interested in that location, in that uh, place. But uh, gold is not like that. It's more like uh, your financial assets, shares, bonds, and other things. You can just take it from one location to another. What I want to stress is, even though gold is considered as unproductive and all those uh, discussions, in practice, gold is the most productive and useful asset for the Indian woman. And something very important I want to mention here, if something is done by Indian woman, it is the most reasonable and rational thing. Do not criticize it. They know instinctively what is good for the family and they are much more for the future, planning the future, worried about the future. Men are not so much worried about the future. Men think that, you know, today I will learn and then send it. But women are much more concerned about what will happen after five years, what will happen after ten years. So that is the reason why he is focused on the gold as of now. And uh, it is not something which is uh, interesting. We did a study on the pension and investment along with ING Global. It has been published in the form of a book in Tata Megrahi, actually, Facing the Future. That time we did a survey of something like uh, 15,000 men, uh, various uh, categories, farmers, lawyers, chartered accountant, uh, professional banker, all type of people asking their investment uh, profile. So one of the question is uh, how much gold your wife has got? So very interesting. Most of them were not having any idea regarding that at all. The variation between what they told and what is actual is 10 sigma or 8 sigma, what I call the devi deviation. Somebody told 40 gram when his wife was having actually 400 gram. Somebody told us 4,000 when his wife was asked. Many of them told we don't have any clue because the one is she goes on changing necklace into anklet, anklet into bracelet, bracelet into can't keep track of it, one thing. Second is, <coughs> it is arts. He keeps, he uh, is off for it. So this is the, so I always used to light-heartedly tell, if the husband doesn't know how much gold his wife is having, how will government of India ever come to know the quantum of the gold in the country? There is some, uh, they say 20,000 tons and other thing. All of them are, I call quota data, POTA, pulled out of thin air. There is no basis for it. And uh, the total quantum of gold available in India, to be very frank, nobody knows. 
including the gold in temples, gold in uh, churches, gold in mosques, various other areas. Anyhow, so this is something very, nothing, you know, some of you might have read in the paper, there is a temple in Thiruvananda, Trivandrum, called uh, the Temple of Padmanabha Swami. And somebody wrote an inland letter telling that temple jewels are not properly maintained and other things. Immediately, Supreme Court took it as a very major issue. They appointed a receiver and they told, uh, go and check everything. And uh, this is, you know, Supreme Court does many a time activities which are totally funny, not required for it to be involved. Anyhow, they went and opened uh, two lockers, you know. The first locker itself, when they opened, they found billions of dollars worth of uh, gold, rubies, uh, diamonds, various other type of uh, chains, necklace, swords, actually. The two only, they opened it. The third one, they have not opened it. And uh, it's a very fascinating thing, actually. The full assessment has not been made public for the worry that uh, it could be misused by global decoits. You know, global thieves are, in Europe, for instance, most protected museum people enter and steal the uh, paintings and other thing and go. So this is something which is the point I want to stress to. Huge amount of gold is there in our temples and various other, and individuals also. And with individuals sometimes going to uh, 50 years, 100 years back in their you know, family heirloom it may become. That's another reason why many would not like to dispose it of because those designs are not easy to get it today. Government of India introduced a scheme if I remember some uh, last decade or something that you deposit gold with the bank you will get some 2% or 4% but many were not coming forward at all for the reason Banks will get your gold in the form of jewelry. They will melt it and give it back to you in the form of a rod or in the form of a slab or something. Many were not enthusiastic because the designs are so unique. It's sometimes, nowadays you may not get those designs at all. The way in which the ornament has been carved in those days is very difficult to replicate. Anyhow, so Total quantum of gold is unknown. Let me be very clear about it. It is something like a hidden wealth, I would say. And when there is a crisis, when there is a credible leader, people would not mind giving it for a noble cause. I remember when I was in school, there was this India-China war. Some of you may have read in the books and other things. It was in the early 60s. The leaders in South, they went around in a jeep. Their leaders of those days, uh, Kamaraj, I am talking about uh, the Madras area, Rajaji, several other leaders went around and uh, they were given cash and some. My aunt actually gave her a banger, gave her banger as a, you know, instantaneously. My uncle was not happy about it, but that's a separate issue. <laughs> Anyhow, what I want to say, if there is a noble cause and a credible leader, this is most important. People won't mind a parting of their gold. Today, imagine in a jeep, all the leaders are going around. The woman will shut their necks and run into the house because they will be worried that these leaders will take away my jobs. So this is something very critical. There is no credible leader. Most of the leaders are considered as chores and uh, there is no, you know, even if there is a noble cause, nobody is going to. My point is, if there is a noble cause and a credible leader, credible means people whom people trust that he is going to be using it for the noble cost. <laughs> From that point of view, the, all the gold with us is a hidden reserve. It's a massive amount, but it's a bigger hidden reserve. So, gold 
is a saving as well as collateral. Next slide, you can see the what we were discussing. Last year, 850 tons were purchased. It is old age security for women. It is divisible, portable, and a major collateral for our non-corporate business, informal sector. What is the collateral? They don't have any uh, big uh, uh, collateral, actually, in terms of house or in terms of uh, insurance policy or nothing. Only bangles and necklaces is the collateral. 60% comes from money lenders of the requirement of credit. So this is something which we should keep in the back of the mind. Now the last area we will come to, most important is, what are the reforms which are required in order to help these uh, informal or uh, non-corporate sector? We have started reforms in the 90s. Many of you will remember, TV Narasimha was actually the Prime Minister at that time. is the initiator of major reform. Unfortunately, he is not being talked about. Neither the party at that time, Congress, nor the opposition is interested. He is sort of forgotten. But actually, he was a very major... <laughs> Sorry. Initiator of big reform. Industrial policy a reform. He removed licensing overnight for making many of the uh, stuff monopoly restrictive. <laughs> Trade Practice Act he modified. He encouraged FDI. He encouraged private, both foreign as well as domestic, in uh, port, airport, telecom television till that we had only one television that is the government television uh, what is known as this Dushar uh, Bharati but now we have huge number of uh, you know, some 600 channels are there. He opened up defense also for the private sector manufacturing and infrastructure he changed the forex and trade policy tax structure was changed Huh. used to have income tax of 95%, uh, believe me. Now it has been brought to 30-33%. So there is a huge amount of changes come about. Next, there is a large amount of reforms in the capital market. You know, there is used to be one bureaucrat called controller of capital issue. He abolished it. There is no need for shares to be priced by a government bureaucrat. Before that, the shares all can be sold only at the price at which this bureaucrat tells the company. It's a very peculiar type of thing. He removed that. He told the shares can be sold based upon the company's uh, decision and then let the buyer decide. He computerized the exchanges, computerized the banking system. So many changes. But we should recall or we should re realize the focus is mainly on the corporate India, not on the informal or unorganized sector, unincorporated. So what is the uh, requirement uh, should be? Yeah. We'll see that next. What uh, reforms are needed is at state level, not at the central level. Commercial tax, of course, now GST has <coughs> come in order to replace commercial tax. But we have road tax, entertainment tax, exchange duty on liquor, those states which are involved in selling liquor, urban land selling, shops and establishment tax. <coughs> Laws governing educational, medical, Money lending regulation, all these. Look at each one of them. They all generate huge amount of bribes. I can tell without uh, difficulty, <coughs> with authority, that every regulation in our country is for making money by the government employees. 
massive amount of corruption. That is what unites the country from Kashmir to Kanyakumari or Ahmedabad to Agartala. That is how we can nowadays say. So much unity. Where is the unity? Unity in corruption. Land registration anywhere in the country, you can't register one square feet of land without <coughs> braving the registrar of lands. Same thing about uh, you know transportation, getting fitness certificate of uh, same thing about uh, electricity connection, water connection, hundreds of these things. And there is something called the Shops and Establishment Act. You must buy and try to read that book. 500 pages at least it will go. The shops are expected to be have clean surrounding. It should have sunshine. There should not be rats in the shop. Can you beat that? Have you? And sitting arrangement should be there. How many shops have got sitting arrangements? You go around a, a city like Ahmedabad, you will find most of the shops you stand outside and then transact business. <laughs> One uh, minister told in southern state, if you have to implement strictly the Shops and Establishment Act, 95% of the shops have to be closed. Very simple. In a city like Bangalore or Chennai or Hyderabad and various cities, the basement of houses are supposed to be for parking of cars. Most of the basement have been converted into shops. So this whole thing is uh, anachronistic. Whole thing is for bribery. Then you have this uh, Food and Adulteration Act. It is another anachronism where uh, you know, every weekend these uh, inspectors go, municipal inspectors, go to the restaurant or a hotel and he collects some 500 rupees or 1000 rupees. That's all. And whenever the amount is not given, one uh, raid is conducted. When it is told your restaurant has got this cockroach or... Actually, I was appointed wrongly. Most of the time I am appointed wrongly only, not rightly. As a chair of the... Uh, committee to look at this uh, Food and Adulteration Act. Lot of discussion and other thing. At the end of it, people asked me, what is your suggestion? I told, scrap this act. They were shocked actually. I told, give me a statistics of how many people have died by eating in this restaurant. They told nobody has died, but <laughs> a lot of people had stomach cups. I told stomach upset can be there even eating at home. That's not an issue. This whole thing is... Uh, uh, sorry. With these days, social media is so popular. If in a hotel, in a dosa, there is a cockroach, for instance. The girl will take a selfie, cockroach, dosa and herself. And within a matter of minutes, it will go to Venezuela. Forget about it. So word of mouth, next day people will be reluctant to visit that restaurant. So there is something called an enlightened self-interest. In other words, even the Pani Puri seller on the road will be careful. He would not like to give you some uh, poisoned stuff or uh, harmful stuff because uh, the local people who have eaten, they will immediately tell others, don't go there. He is a risky fellow or nothing. <laughs> so, enlightened self-interest is extremely important. So, let there be regulation, but let it be for severe and swift punishment. For instance, there are a lot of buildings, there are fire regulations are there. <laughs> but most of the times fire takes place and uh, it is found out that they have not followed the remote. So what we should have is regulation which is uh, very strict in case of any 
for instance, a lift in one of the towns, what they have done is they have re re removed completely the lift inspection. They told the respective apartment uh, association should take care of it. If there is a failure, then uh, it should be severely punished. That is the most important and swiftly. Many times cases take seven years, ten years and above. That doesn't help. It should be within a period of one year. And the enlightened self-interest. Anyhow, if the apartment has got lift, the people who are using it will be worried that it should be properly functioning in other Otherwise, they are going to be affected. <coughs> Not outside. So, this is something which uh, all these areas generate black money. Our estimate is 10% of our GDP is in the form of black money due to these areas. Last year, our GDP was 2,50,000 crores. That means 25 lakh crore is the black money generated annually. <laughs> so, most important is to have reforms in these areas which will facilitate or which will help our non-corporate, the smallest groups, because they are the ones which are worst affected. And the smaller you are, the larger is the percentage of bravery which you have to pay. This is something very, very important. The smaller you, for instance, the vegetable vendor who earns something like 500 rupees, she has to pay some 20 to 30 rupees per day for doing it in the platform to the cops. So, we have to focus on the smaller group, how much they are affected, and what type of reforms would benefit them. As I told you earlier, technology will help to some extent in some of these areas. So, our focus in the next five years should be how to minimize all the state level regulation, municipal level regulation, and then uh, make uh, what you may loosely call making business more friendlier, ease of doing <coughs> business. Ease of doing business is not conducting seminars at Delhi. That's not ease of doing business. Ease of doing business is looking at all these regulatory things. So thank you very much, sir for your patient hearing and uh, kindly buy my book. I am not uh, insisting you should read it. You can buy it. That's enough for me. <laughs> Charlie, we'll, uh, we'll link the Amazon link as well. So Aparna has asked a question uh, in the chat box. She has asked, what is the impact of demonetization on the uh, informal economy, as one would call it? Oh, not only on the informal, but on others also. There has been a huge amount of impact in terms of uh, getting the, you know, what is called the black funds, black money. But uh, that's a one-time event, let's be very clear, not uh, repeated again and again. But a much better thing, according to me, is to make a holding of cash beyond, say, 5 lakh as a crime. Europe had it uh, after Second World War, the same type of thing. For instance, I can have crores of rupees in my home. Sometimes it comes in photograph and other thing when the raid takes place. <coughs> That's not a crime. They have to establish that this money is disproportionate to the known sources of income. It takes a lot of years to establish it. Instead of that, Straight away, you can say, if you hold more than 5 lakh as cash at a particular point of tax, it can be a crime. And in the context of digital payment and digital transaction increasing, this will be easier actually, much easier. The second is, agriculture should also be taxed. Those who are 
relatively doing very well off in agriculture. There are many agriculturists I know who are earning 40 crore, 50 crore like that. Net income I am telling. Not all, of course. I am only telling anything beyond 1 crore net income in agriculture. You should bring it under the tax net. These are the two things which uh, help in terms of uh, our uh, reducing the black money. Demonetization was a good step according to me. It did uh, bring out uh, something like 90% uh, of the funds that time went into bank. Once they go into bank, it becomes part of the white or legal economy. That is what is most important to understand. Okay. Oh, sir, we get a lot of questions that I get to hear is that uh, this un you know this uh, informal sector or this unincorporated sector is actually not required. We should uh, you know corporatize them and we should make them formal and then it will be beneficial for them as well. They are suffering and you know it is better that we get rid of it. It's of no use. It's backward. Uh, what do you suggest, sir? Should it remain as it is or should it be corporatized or no, important? You know, what exactly you mean by making it uh, formal? You know, you mean all of them should uh, wear pant uh, instead of dhoti and uh, uh, have cigarette smoking instead of BD smoking or pan? You know, what exactly? It's not clear to me anyhow. Just by forming on, uh, you know, calling them. For instance, when this uh, Aravind Subramaniam and uh, Raghuram Rajan were in charge, they began to call a section of this uh, so-called unorganized sector as Posse Corporate. If you look at the last two, three years of uh, national accounts, you will suddenly find one category called Posse Corporate. I, it's very funny actually because you have to be corporate or you have to be not corporate. Posse corporate is something like partly pregnant. You know, you can't be, you can either be pregnant or not pregnant. There is nothing called in between, right? One. Second is, <coughs> converting them all into company is not necessarily uh, helpful because large number of companies are dummy in India, actually. So, point is, the non-corporate or whatever, the form of organization, they should get better credit. They should have lesser amount of governmental interference. And uh, they should have more facilities in order to market their products. So whether they all become company form of organization or not is not material, according to me. Right? Some people in the West are concerned about privacy due to digital economy. So, India seems to be taking digital currency well. So, uh, what are uh, your thoughts on it, about India digitizing its economy? Oh, no, no, no. Digitizing per se is not any thing to be worried about or anything because you are not uh, digitizing as in the context of the West. They are more worried about cryptocurrency and various other new type of uh, uh, activities. We are not doing that actually. We are only digitizing in transaction. We are not uh, RBI or others are not giving up their role and uh, we still have huge amount of uh, requirement of cash and everything. So I think uh, we should be very clear our digitization facilitate in terms of transacting of uh, activities and uh, to that extent that will reduce or minimize the black money in the system. Next. Uh, so one more question uh, oh. that I have for you is that uh, you said that the country is our country is bank oriented. So what are the rural trends in terms of money lending? Like how much do rural people depend on banks to lend their money? Uh, maybe 25-30%, not more than that. Okay. Uh, Rajabhishek ji has uh, typed his question down. He says, Sir, we know our Indic community was always divided into many castes and sub-castes. Now, in this scenario, what sort of principles of recruitment did Indians follow in ancient and medieval times? What did the recruiters use to see in entrusting a person before giving any responsibility in previous times? Well, I don't think it's very relevant to our talk today, uh, Rajapi Sheikh Ji, and that's a very big question for Sir to answer. 
but uh, we can have him over for uh, a session like this on some other time would you like to take that question sir or should we leave it away what is the essence of that question uh, he is saying God. that uh, that uh, there were caste and sub caste in the ancient times so what uh, patterns of recruitment were followed uh, in the economy back then no actually there is a book of caste as social capital of mind or there is one uh, talk i have given in indus which is available in the net you should uh, have a look at that i would say it might uh, provide him some clues right okay well with that so we conclude the question answer session and we come to the end of this talk thank you very much for uh, such uh, valuable insights especially on the on the uh, significance and indispensability of the housewife uh, in the economy and her contribution uh, from that to uh, understanding the importance of reforms and uh, several unnecessary laws that need to be scrapped uh, you have truly enlightened us and uh, given us uh, a lot to think about thank you very much sir namaste